True it is to say on a day like this that this is a day that the Lord has made. 
So let us rejoice and be glad in it. I want to welcome each and every one of you to this morning's Easter service. We're glad that you're here. If you happen to be a visitor with us today, we're especially glad that you are with us. Perhaps you're with family or from our community and here visiting on Easter Sunday, but we're delighted that you chosen to be a part of us uh, today and also say a word of welcome to all of those who are watching out in the cyber world through uh, the miracle of live streaming. We're glad that all of you are part of this service on this day. Um, a couple of things real quickly to uh, announce. Uh, first of all, the church office will be closed tomorrow uh, for the uh, Easter Monday celebration. So uh, the church office will reopen again first thing on Tuesday morning. Uh, the uh, Presbyterian women will have their uh, Bible study here on uh, Tuesday morning, April the 2nd, beginning at 1030. And I understand that coffee and light refreshments, as it says here in the bulletin, you can read as well as I can, uh, will be uh, ready by 10 o'clock that morning, but the meeting proper will start uh, at 1030, chapter 9 of the book, Sacred Encounters. Also, uh, beginning uh, this week, every Tuesday afternoon at 3 o'clock for the month, there will be an opportunity to do some exercise, uh, weather permitting. It's going to be outside each of those times in the parking lot, but sponsored by Jasper Health Services. So come and be a part of that if you'd like a, a group of people to exercise with. It's a nice uh, community activity, way to get some exercise in fresh air. So that starts this Tuesday and will be every Tuesday, as I understand it, uh, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Also, next Saturday, I know our property committee would want me to announce again that we will have our church work day next Saturday morning, 8 o'clock uh, here, and uh, going to hope for good weather and going to try to beautify the grounds, going to try to do some work inside as well as outside. Anything, Jamie, special to announce related to that? Come. More, bodies we have. More bodies we have, and anything to bring work gloves? Just a good bring a good attitude. You heard it from him. There you go. I want to thank all of our musicians today. We have handbells playing. We have the choir singing. We have Gene playing the organ. God bless you, Gene, for that, and Kathy for your piano, and Mary Lou Jordan as our liturgist today. And so I want to thank all of the people who are helping to make worship possible on this day. May the Lord bless you on this Easter Sunday. Mary Lou, I will turn it over to you. Good morning. Oh, it's so good to see some of y'all. It really is. And um, I'm so glad y'all played that um, song. I've been humming that or thinking about that. Oh, what a morning all week. We've had a wonderful week. Just lots of things that have happened at this church and in the community. And our minister's been at every one of them. So bless him. He can go home. Well, no, he can't. His grandson's here. But I started to say he could go home and take a nap. He, is, he has preached or brought a message five times this week, and we are thankful to have him here doing that, and it's been great. All right, if you will join me then, and we will read responsibly the call to worship. Let there be songs of victory to you, O God. Let the whole assembly sing of your salvation. For our strength and our salvation. We have cried to you, and you have answered. Give thanks to God for the goodness of resurrection and new life. All right, if you'll join me in the prayer for invocation, ending with the Lord's Prayer, please bow your heads. Glory to you, O God, who on this day won victory over death raising Jesus from the grave and giving us eternal life. Glory to you, O Christ, who for us and for our salvation overcame death and opened the gate to everlasting life. Glory to you, Holy Spirit, who leads us into the truth of Easter morning. Glory to you, O blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever, as we now pray the prayer Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
All right, now I'll ask you to stand and you'll remain standing un for the next activities until the children's moment. So stand now and sing together hymn number th two, three, two. Jesus Christ is risen today. called conf to confession, Jesus' rising from the grave assures us that we too have been given new life. Let us now repent of our sin before God and one another, certain of God's mercy. Join me now in the unison prayer of confession. Living God, we confess that we look for the living among the dead. We are slow to believe the promise of the prophets and are frightened and filled with doubt, even when you stand among us. Forgive us, God of grace. Open our hearts to receive your word and to share it with others. Feed us with the bread of life that death cannot destroy or diminish. These things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior. Amen. And this is the assurance of pardon. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. In Christ, we are forgiven and given life everlasting. Thanks be to God.
may be seated. And I just saw Charlie, little red-headed Charlie back there looking at me. I'm so glad to see him at church today. All right, let's all the little squash blossoms come and John. Here. Am I on? Yeah. Over here, squash blossoms. Right here. We're going to... Oh, come on, kids. Come on, squash blossoms. If you don't know you're a squash blossom, you look like this. <laughs> come on over. Right up the aisle here. Right up the aisle. And you can stay sit standing. Right up the aisle. Hey, Bubba. How are you? All right. That's good right there. Okay. We're just... What we're going to do is you have to remember that this week, this Easter is such a happy day, but the week, this week was always not a happy week. It has some low spots in it. And what we do here for the last 25 years is the Easter countdown. So everybody stand up. Everybody's up. Because after Palm Sunday, everybody is up. You're going to count down 10 to 1. You'll say the number 10. You'll start with 10, and I'll say what's going on, what's happening. Each time you say a number, the first number is we go down a little bit each time. So once we get to five, we're going to be at the lowest. And then we're going to turn it around for Easter. And at the end, I'll say hallelujah, you say hallelujah, and we'll just see how many of those we do, okay? But we want to wake up the Baptist with the hallelujahs. <laughs> All right, so let's start with ten. Ten. He was betrayed by a kiss. Down a little bit. Nine, deserted by his friends. Eight, taken to Pontius Pilate. Seven, where the Romans flogged him. Six, they nailed him to a cross. Five, and when he was dead, they sealed him in a tomb. Four, but the tomb couldn't hold him. Three, he was raised from the dead. Two, where he was seen by his friends and disciples. One, and he lives in heaven and rules forever. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. All right, if you'll bow for a prayer before we read our scripture. Open our eyes and soften our hearts, O God, through the work of your Holy Spirit, that in the hearing of your word, we may receive the new life that only you can give us. Amen. If you'd like to turn in your pew Bible, it's page 652. We're in Isaiah 25th chapter, verses 6 through 9. On this mountain of the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wine stained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the covering that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, See, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you.
Our second scripture reading on this morning is from Mark's Gospel, the 16th chapter, verses 1 through 8. Listen again for God's word. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, here is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb. For terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. They made their way to the tomb where Jesus had been laid with very, very heavy hearts, for it seemed now that all was lost. The man... They loved and admired the one they called Lord and Master had been put to death by the powers of this world. And they had been utterly helpless in the face of it all. There was nothing that they could do to prevent it. They had only been able to view the whole unthinkable scene from a distance with their only hope being that they might see where the body had been placed so that they could come along later and anoint the body for burial. These three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome were among his closest friends. They had always seen to his basic needs when he was in Galilee, but they had been unable to attend to such things in Jerusalem. They were not only his closest friends in the good times, but together they constituted the faithful remnant of those who had remained behind in the bad times. The disciples had all fled for fear of their own lives the night that he was arrested. And the crowds of people that shouted out hosannas whenever, when he had first entered the great city of Jerusalem had all turned their backs when the machine of persecution revved up its engine and put him to death. So they were a faithful remnant. All that was left behind of the following that he had gathered in his brief time of ministry. Only these three women apparently remained in the account given to us by Mark. The location of the tomb was the only thing that they knew or could remember. They, like all of the other uh, people, had forgotten that Christ had said that he would go ahead to Galilee after he was raised up. He had said that, but they had not remembered it. The tomb of death was their only reality on that first Easter morning as they awoke and went to the tomb. They had waited for the sun to begin its ascent in the sky, thus ending the Sabbath to make their way over and perform their function of mercy and duty. They carried with them spices, and it was only on the journey there to the tomb that a dilemma had occurred to them. How would they uncover the tomb? Who could possibly help them roll away the enormous stone that blocked their passage? How could that impossible barrier ever be overcome? P perhaps they just resigned themselves to saying that they would figure it all out once they finally arrived. But when they did arrive, the barrier had been removed for the stone that covered the tomb had been rolled away. They then entered the tomb where Jesus' body had been laid, but there was no corpse within it, only a young man in a white robe who told them not to be alarmed that Jesus, who was crucified, had been raised. Now, if that weren't enough of a shock to their systems, they were further instructed to go 
and to tell the disciples that Jesus had gone ahead of them, had gone ahead of them on to Galilee, and that they could find him there, just as he had promised. Dropping their jars of spices on the floor of the tomb, they all fled in terror and amazement. And they didn't tell anyone because they were afraid. And that's the way that Mark ends the gospel, his gospel. The few faithful followers of Christ fleeing the empty tomb in terror and amazement, vowing to themselves not to tell anyone what they had seen and heard, and just as significantly not who they had not seen and heard from. For many people, this is a most unsatisfactory ending. There is no appearance of the risen Jesus. There's no sense of resolution or closure. There are only the shouts and the shrieks of three women fleeing the tomb, unsure of what to do next, with the future of the Christian church hanging in the balance. It's almost universally thought by credible Bible scholars that this is the original ending to Mark's gospel. That surprises some people to hear, but that's almost certainly the case. The most ancient manuscripts all have the gospel ending in this way. It is only in later manuscripts that two other endings are inserted, likely by early scribes who were just as disturbed, just as unsettled by the ambiguous nature of Mark's original ending as you and I may be. Some contemporary translations add both a shorter and a longer ending, but they list them as such, or else they add these endings into the footnotes, something like that. But we can be relatively certain that the original ending of Mark is that of the women fleeing the tomb in terror and amazement. Even among those who accept this, there has long been speculation that perhaps the original copy of Mark's gospel manuscript was damaged in some way that made additional verses unreadable. Maybe the last page had been lost. Maybe Mark had had a heart attack or some other sort of illness in the middle of writing the end of his gospel. Maybe Roman soldiers came in the middle of the night to arrest him for being a Christian. And this was as far as he got. He never got to tell us about the risen Christ. It's long been noticed that the very last sentence ends with a conjunction. If there are any English teachers out there, you know if you're a teacher of composition, you would mark your student's paper with red ink if they ended a sentence in a conjunction. The last sentence in the Greek literally reads this way. And no one anything they told they were afraid for. And this is where the gospel ends, like it or not. Whatever the textual and compositional issues may be, whatever may be the issues with all that fancy stuff that I learned once upon a time in seminary, this is our passage for today. And it is my belief and the belief of many other people that this is both what Mark intended for his gospel to end, the way he intended for it to end, and also it is what God wants us to have and wants us to consider and reflect upon as we examine the mystery of Easter resurrection. Yes, it is a thing of mystery for us to proclaim that Christ is risen, even though it is a central tenet of our faith. Mark, perhaps more than any other gospel, helps us to see this with his ambiguous, seemingly incomplete ending to the story of Jesus' life and ministry. It may well be the case that Mark is less interested in proving the truth of Jesus' resurrection than he is in evoking within those who read his words a sense of awe and mystery about it. I personally think that it's a rather unfortunate thing that we live in a world that provides so little room these days for mystery. The legacy of the Enlightenment in Europe is one in which things that are mysterious, those things that defy any kind of empirical explanation, are kind of set aside as lesser realities than those things that can be proved in a kind of unver uh, in a verifiable way. Though we all benefit greatly from the advances in our world of science and technology, the modern world has lost some of that sense of awesome wonder that our ancestors felt whenever they thought and prayed about the wonders of the universe, 
whenever they looked up into the sky to ponder what was there, whenever they thought about nature itself and the ways that things in our world work. Having bought into a, a Newtonian worldview, Sir Isaac Newton's worldview, in which all things work together, obeying the same immutable laws of nature like component pieces of some great giant machine, we have lost the role played by God in things that defy our normal ways of perceiving. Things like the miracle of resurrection, of life emerging out of death. One writer states it very well when she says the following. She says, it is a telling sign of our times that the phrase scientific studies show carries far more weight than thus says the Lord. All of this isn't to say, certainly isn't to say, that we should turn back the hands of time to a more innocent era of history if that were even possible to do. I suspect that most of us would prefer living in the world that we live in today than in the Middle Ages during that time when our Savior walked the face of the earth. I think most of us would prefer to live now instead of back then. What I'm trying to say is that somehow, somehow with the faith that we have been given by God, we need to re-enchant the sense of mystery and awe and wonder that people once felt regarding things that were unseen. We need to allow for the mystery of God to play a role in the ways that we perceive the world and the ways that we live our lives. We need to have faith in form our understanding. The events of the Holy Week that culminate with Easter speak to us of the meaning of death in the midst of life. And they also speak to us of the meaning of life in the midst of death. They call us out of our tendency to deny the reality of death and to see it with new eyes. That is to say, to see it through the eyes of faith. Where from a human perspective, death seems to be the final word, an end to the things that we know and can perceive. We find that on Easter morning, God gives us a new perspective, that death is not the final word, nor will it ever be. I remember one time reading an article by a freelance writer whose name was Diane Cameron, and she told the following story about being at a, a low point in her life, a time when her sister had just died. Her brothers were seriously ill. Her best friend was leaving town, and her own sense of vocation was being called into question. It was a difficult time for Miss Cameron. Her sense of depression was deep, but she found herself compelled to attend an Easter service uh, when Easter rolled around one year from a sense of duty as much as anything else. And the minister who was preaching that day said something that really resonated with her. He said, we live in a Good Friday world, a world filled with suffering, loss, and grief. Now that was certainly something that uh, she, Miss Cameron, and many of us could easily identify with. And then the minister continued on in his remarks to say, but we are an Easter people. Reflecting back upon this experience of that worship service, she wrote, The gift of that Easter service many years ago was the reminder that we, by religion or by culture, are a people who believe in possibility. When our hearts are shattered, we are sometimes shocked to discover that there is joy as well as pain inside. What I think she was saying, in other words, is that the central mystery of Holy Week is really quite true. There is death in the midst of life, and there is life in the midst of death. But the three women who fled the tomb that first Easter morning were hard-pressed to understand such a thing as that. All they knew was that Jesus' body was missing from the place where it should be. All their hope had been lost on the day that he was crucified. So how could they find new hope in the miracle of resurrection? 
How could they possibly gather their thoughts and their prayers and make the trek up to Galilee in order to find the new hope of the risen Christ who had promised to be there awaiting their arrival? The ending of Mark's Gospel is ironic in the way that it reverses all of the, the previous stories of healing that are told in Mark's Gospel. In nearly every single instance of Jesus' ministry where someone receives a healing from Jesus, Jesus tells the eyewitnesses not to tell anyone. It's the messianic secret. Don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. But they all go off and tell everybody. But here the women are told to go and tell the disciples what they have seen and heard, but they flee the tomb vowing to keep silent. And that is where Mark's gospel leaves us. So the silence of the women at the tomb shifts the burden to us. What do we do with the good news that we have been given? Do we keep silent? Or do we go to Galilee to find Christ waiting there for us? Do we flee or do we follow? Our response makes all the difference in the world. There's a well-known piece written back in 1926, nearly 100 years ago, hard to believe, by a pastor whose name was Dr. James Francis. And it is called One Solitary Life. Some of you may have heard this before, but I certainly think that it bears repeating this morning. Dr. Francis wrote the following words. Here is a man who was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another village. He worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never owned a home. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family. He never went to college. He never set foot in a big city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place where he was born. He never did any of the things that usually accompany greatness in our world. He had no credentials but himself. While he was still a young man, the tide of public, popular, popular opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied knowing him. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through a mockery of a trial. He was nailed upon a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for the only piece of property he had on this earth, his coat. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. These are the facts of his human life. Today we look back across 1,900 years and ask what kind of trail he has left across the centuries. When we try to sum up his influence, all the armies that ever marched, all the parliaments and congresses that ever met, all the kings that ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of humanity upon this earth as powerfully as has that one solitary life. What a testimony to the one we proclaim to be our Lord and Savior. And yet we might wonder why this one solitary life has left such a profound influence. Why is it that Jesus changed the world as he did? In a word, the answer is resurrection. Resurrection. The great Scottish Bible scholar William Barclay puts it like this. One thing is certain. If Jesus had not risen from the dead, we would never have heard of him. The attitude of the women was that they had come to pay the last tribute to a dead body. The attitude of the disciples was that everything had finished in tragedy. By far the best proof of the resurrection is the existence of the Christian church. Nothing else could have changed sad and despairing men and women into people radiant with joy and flaming with courage. The resurrection is the central fact of the whole Christian faith. So we see without resurrection there is no church. 
Jesus is rendered merely to be a prophet, a healer, a teacher of unprecedented wisdom, all wonderful things, but without resurrection, He is not our Savior. It is resurrection that brings the world new life and hope that could not come to us in any other way. So the tomb is empty, and the women have fled. We can be certain that their silence will be broken. They will, in time, find words to say and a witness to bring. And they will follow their risen Lord to Galilee and find Him there as He had promised. But the burden now shifts to us. Will we flee or will we follow? Will we keep silent about the good news that we have received or will we shout it from the highest mountaintop? Is this the end of the story? Or is it only just a beginning? To God alone be all praise, all honor, all glory, now and forevermore. Amen. Let us pray. O God of crosses carried in empty tombs, we gather our prayers on this morning with thanksgiving for the countless ways that you have revealed yourself to us for comfort amid life's trials, for hope in times of despair, for wisdom when quick and easy answers elude us, for glimpses of truth when so many false teachings seem, seek to claim our attention, most of all for the testimony of Christ and the witness of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives and the lives of so many others. We're grateful for the love of family and friends and opportunities we have to gather together with those people we love the most. We're thankful for the support of those who remember us in their prayers and through gestures of kindness. We're thankful for the freedoms we enjoy but so often take for granted and for the sacrifices of others that make that possible. Today we would lift in prayer those who serve their communities and their country. We pray for firefighters and police officers for emergency medical personnel, and especially on this day for men and women in military service. We pray that you would protect and preserve all such persons who place themselves in harm's way, serving causes greater than themselves. Because we know that our Lord and Savior told us peacemaking is a blessed endeavor, we pray for the process of peacemaking wherever it may be taking place in our world and for the individuals engaged in it. Empower diplomats and politicians, and those in the highest levels of government to always seek peaceable solutions to matters of discord, that warfare may only be a final solution. And still in the world, that biblical vision of a day when lambs will lie down with lions, that peace on earth might be realized, let us never lose sight of such a vision as that. Lord of divine medicine, we pray for those who uh, are on our prayer list, we Pray for people we know are in need of healing, whether in body or in spirit. We pray for those who are getting ready to undergo physical therapy and rehabilitative medicine. Pray for those recuperating from surgeries. We pray for all of us, all of us who uh, suffer from allergies in this springtime of the year when the sniffles are so plentiful and, and, uh, and, and so uh, abundant in our world of, uh, of spring blooming and pollen bursting forth. Pray that you would grant courage and strength and wholeness to those who are sick, those who are afflicted, those who find themselves broken. That you would give resolve to those who are fighting addiction. And that you would bring reconciliation to families or individuals who are estranged from one another. Provide shelter for those who are homeless, food and drink for those who hunger and thirst. Safe haven for those who live in places where violence is an everyday affair. O God of the church, reformed and always reforming, we pray that on this Easter day the church would find its common voice in the hope of resurrection that Christ brings us all. May we have new life as we bear witness to life emerging out of death, light emerging out of darkness, hope emerging out of hopelessness. May Easter bring new life, not only pointing ahead to the life yet to come, but also in this life, this great gift you have given each one of us. 
Have us to use our lives to build up rather than break down. And shape us to be stewards of your goodwill and your glorious love. May this Easter remind us of the hope that each new morning brings and the truth of your promises as we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior, who shall reign forever and ever. Amen.
We invite all of you, if you are able to at this time, to please stand as we affirm our faith together, saying the words of the Apostles' Creed. They are printed in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. God has blessed our lives in many different ways, in some ways that are material and physical, in some ways that are spiritual. So for the blessings of God, let us be thankful, and let us show our thankfulness now in the form of an offering.
Let us pray. Lord God, we pray that you would receive the gifts we bring on this morning, that they might be acceptable in your sight, that we might, as stewards of your purposes, be able to use them in ways that are wise and good, in places of need, both near and far. Help us to be discerning in these things. Help us to be generous of spirit and help us to worship and be instruments of your peace in all that we say and do. For it is in Jesus' loving and righteous name that we pray. Amen. Our final hymn of this morning's service is from the Cokesbury Hymnal, hymn number 241, from the Cokesbury Hymnal, He Lives. Now may the peace of God, the peace that surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of God's only Son, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us and those we love, those who love God's kingdom everywhere, both now and forevermore. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.